Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. So, have you decided yet what you're going to be for Halloween? Boo. Hey, we're amongst friends here. Nobody's going to tell you to grow up. Are you the kind of person that just loves to put on makeup to look scary? Do you love the smell of fake blood? Yeah, me too. Now, some households always have spare light bulbs on hand. I always have to have at least one tube of fake blood around. Hey, priorities, people. Now, because of that, I had one convention circled on the calendar for October that I was eager to attend. That would be Sinister Creature Con in Sacramento, California. It promised to be unique because it focused more on makeup effects and the oddities around the work than it did say, horror movie celebrities. Now, Sacramento is a horror-friendly town. Bob Wilkins, who became a horror host legend with Creature Features, got his start in Sacramento before he moved the show to the Bay Area. And modern horror host Mr. Lobo, he shot his syndicated show Cinema Insomnia there. And the Sacramento Horror Film Festival, that's been going strong for a decade now, and it has a reputation as a champion of independent horror films. Now, this was the second year for the Sinister Creature Con, which means it's new. Now, it promotes itself as a showcase for the horror genre craftsmen and craftswomen that give monsters and the genre its tangible essence. This includes painters, filmmakers, sculptors, tattoo artists, comic book artists, graphic designers, practical FX companies, actors, writers, and even haunted attraction engineers. It's a small convention in size. This year, it was held at the Scottish Rite Masonic Center, which has a 9,500-square-foot main dealer's room. But the con itself takes up every corner of this building. If there was a coat room, it was turned into an attraction spot. But it's not just vendors and celebrities and workshops that make the packed Scottish Rite Center feel like it's about to burst past capacity. The ambition and heart of the convention is bigger than the event itself. I attribute a lot of that to the Sinister Creature Con staff and to its founder, Tim Meunier. Tim has a decade-long track record of success creating events as the founder of the Sacramento Horror Film Festival. He created the con after one too many bad personal convention experiences. You know, the same celebrities and the same vendors, and nobody seems excited to be there. At Sinister Creature Con, the show literally spills out into the streets. There's an after-party full of horror-themed musicians, acrobats, and burlesque acts that goes on deep into the night. But the real reason that I felt Sinister Creature Con was a success was the presence of the craftsmen and craftswomen who were there to show off their talent. There was a representative from the reality show Oddities, and he was selling bizarre medical devices and human bones. Yes, yes, yes. There were sculptors there with life-size busts of John Merrick, the Elephant Man, and there were vendors with movie props. But the real standouts were the special effects makeup artists because these folks came there to create. Because creating is fun. Several of these effects studios were featured on the reality show Face Off. Others were new to the industry and they were just up-and-comers. If you walk the aisles, there were artists creating creatures right before your eyes. And they did it all day long, inviting you into their special world. It is fascinating and intoxicating to watch talented people create with complete passion. It turned the vendor's room into a playpen. And not all the creation was being done with latex. There were food artists there who designed confections and savories with a flair for the grotesque. 
One of the things that I noticed was that many of the special effects teams were shops owned by women with many women on staff. Now, if you watch the credits in any film, you'll notice there's very few women's names, especially in the SFX or makeup effects field. I found this to be an interesting and refreshing change of pace that there were so many women here. So I decided to interview some of the women who were creating some of the most fascinating, horrible, beautiful creatures. I spoke with several artists, and whether their medium was latex and pancake makeup or cake batter and food coloring, there was one common thread that ran through it all. There's a playfully subversive element to their art, and the shock on people's faces when they see what they've made is the spark that excites them to create. And here are a few of the people who are overjoyed to talk with me about it. The first thing I noticed about Erin Koskela was the large jar of eyeballs, ears, and intestines at her table. Hell, that's better than a business card. Erin was applying some realistic bite wounds to a model when a gentleman walked by who was dressed in a full Andrew Lloyd Webber version Phantom of the Opera costume. She asked him if he had makeup under his white half mask. He didn't. And she said she'd love to do scar makeup for him, free of charge, just to do it. Like I said, passion and play made these artists stand out. Aaron is a newcomer to makeup effects and is pretty much self-taught. And yet, within a year of jumping in with both feet, she has four credits to her name. And her work is very impressive. During the convention, she took a tiny young woman and turned her into an ancient man, a character named Elfrin the Seer. With a full white beard, liver-spotted jowls, bloody bandages over the eyes, and a weathered robe and a staff made of tree limbs, you couldn't guess there was a woman under there. She and her husband have just moved to Los Angeles to start her shop, Coast Killa SFX. I interviewed Erin from the crowded floor of the convention while she applied makeup effects on me. Aaron decided to give me a Fight Club makeover. I'm here at the Sacramento Horror Festival uh, at Sinister Creature Con. And I'm here with uh, Aaron Koskella. Aaron Koskella. Aaron Koskella, who's going to beat me up as of right now. She's a makeup artist now uh, residing down in Los Angeles. Yep. And she is going to Fight Club the hell out of me right now because that's what she wanted to do. Yep, we're gonna. I ripped up my sponge here a little bit, so it kind of creates like a definite, like bruising type texture. I get a little like vein and broken blood vessel oh, awesome. type of like look to it. So I haven't done this on anybody here yet. So you would be the first one. So you're gonna walk around a little bit different. Excellent. I like it. Uh, I hope people question whether or not I actually got into a fight or not. I guarantee you, nobody will even say anything to you <laughs> because like they're gonna know that it's real. What it is. All right, awesome. Good to hear. So, how long have you been doing what you're doing? I just started actually. I started um, in the spring of last year with my very first special effects um, thing. So, I was just trying it out and um, I bought a few things online because I was like, oh, this seems like a cool thing, like entertainment. I'm like, heck yeah, I want to try that out. So, I ordered some basic generic uh, supplies and put it to work in my house in my living room and I hated it so I was like I want something that looks real I want to do something that looks real and so I started researching I looked at YouTube tutorials I looked at mostly other artists work and I'm like I think I can recreate that now how am I gonna do that so um, I just kind of started there did you have an art background um, a little bit. Like, I've been artsy. I've been creative. <laughs> um, sculpting, painting, drawing. Um, I love Halloween, of course. And uh, that's about it. So I've taken, like, two art classes. Mm. That's about it. So what fascinated you so much that you ended up doing this? Because um, it sounds like it's a relatively new passion. Yeah. <laughs> kind of came out of nowhere. Um, so I guess the fact that, like... It's like doing Halloween every day, and I love Halloween. And I was extremely star like inspired by Star Trek and um, anything zombie related, uh, anything sci-fi related. It just I don't know. I've always thought that was cool. Behind the scenes, anything fascinated me like to no end. So it just seemed like a natural like thing to do. Like okay, I guess I'll go with it. <laughs> Put it out there. So you mentioned that you went on YouTube and looked at different artists. Who was the artist that uh, stopped in your tracks and you said, that's what I'd like to do? Oh, my goodness. Um, there were so many. Like, I can't 
I can't think of like one specific artist, but there's so many good artists out there that like a lot of times they're just nobodies. Like they don't, they're not well known. I wouldn't say nobodies, but they're not well known. And, um, but they're so good and they're so inspiring. Like I just look at their work and I drew inspiration from it and I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it. Who was your first victim? Because this sounds like somebody had to be the sacrificial lamb. Unfortunately, that would be my husband. <laughs> my husband has been so patient with me, <laughs> dressing him up every few days. Like, oh, I need to work on this one thing. I need to try a look. Let me sit down. Let me work on this with you. So, Is he also a Halloween fan? Um, Not really. Like, I usually choose his Halloween costume for him. I choose... <laughs> what he's going to be for the year like yeah and then zombies in between whenever we get a chance <laughs> that's my wife is a trekker a trekkie yeah yes. so she's Me not too. she's not a big horror fan at all she's learning though because she has to live with someone whose passion is just kind of taking them in this position how'd your husband deal with uh one day you're not doing this and the next day you're like we're going to go to LA yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to do this professionally. He's really supportive. I'm really lucky to have somebody that's so willing to follow my dreams with me. Uh, he works in mental health. And so uh, it's not really like his genre of things that he's interested in. But I mean, he's very, very, very supportive and is willing to follow me wherever I want to go. And uh, That's awesome. So it sounds like you liked horror at least a little bit or you were fascinated by it for a while was it a childhood thing or did you grow into it um actually i've hated horror for a long time like scary movies uh was something i avoided like the plague i've had like a really weak stomach and kind of i don't know things scare me easily so there i'm like there's no way i'm what you can't get me to watch it you can't pay me to watch a scary movie and um, when I started getting into this, I'm like, well, I guess I kind of need to because it's going to be my job one day. <laughs> so I've recently gotten into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any films that really interest you the most or do you go to the more effects-laden ones? Um, well, there's special effects in almost probably any movie or TV show that you watch. You just don't realize it. Right. Um, but my favorite genre, genre would probably have to be like sci-fi for sure. Um, yeah. Making aliens and making all kinds of things. Uh, I like blood and gore, but I want to kind of move on right. like, past that. I almost feel like I should have asked you to do an alien because you brought it yeah. up like three times now. And I'm I, going, I, I, I don't know. Do an alien. I don't know how to do it yet. So oh. that's what I'm going to school for so I can learn. Yeah. Uh, uh, what school are you going? Uh, cinema makeup school down okay. in L.A. So. Uh, it interests me because you mentioned that uh, you... Um, like, uh, there's makeup in just about everything. You just don't know it. Yeah. Uh, Dick Smith mm -hmm. was a guy who was really, really big on old age makeup and things oh, like that. Amazing. Um, incredible. Absolutely. I did a podcast on him because yeah. uh, it was just so amazing. Um, do you have you done old age makeup or tried it? I have. Um, actually, the very first gig that I ever got was on a, a film. Uh, it's going to be airing here, I guess, pretty soon. It's a short uh, film, Firefly fan film called uh -huh. Shadows on the Wind. And uh, I did an old age makeup on Nicole here. <laughs> and that was my very first, like, actual gig makeup that I did. And I was, like, terrified. I sculpted, like, this whole face thing, like, in different pieces, following, like, the Dick Smith, like, method, right? And um, it just, I saw her and I was like, oh, this is definitely not going to work. And I scrapped the whole thing. And I did, like, a basic, like latex like stipple stretch and stipple technique which is like yeah. so classic like old age like for theater or whatever and um but it looked like so natural and it worked like out, it worked out really well for me in the film i mean it's believable so that's awesome <laughs> yeah. yeah see i like that kind of stuff too i mean obviously i'm a horror fan so yeah you know, i like uh sometimes the intense stuff such as mm -hmm. like uh Rob Bottin's makeup in the thing, which is more of a special effect than it is a makeup effect. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, what I had heard was, I don't know, I'm assuming you've seen the film. No. No? no. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, I, I recommend, and I'm keeping this eye closed because I'm not sure if there's al You're good. alcohol You're good. or anything yeah. in there. Okay. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's one of those uh, movies that is well worth it for a makeup person. I'm familiar with the makeup. Oh, okay. So you know the makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, head yeah. of that entire piece. They actually fooled the actors. They thought that the actor was actually laying there with his belly exposed and like, why are you doing that? And it was one of his friends who knew him forever uh -huh. came over and then realized 
there's a, just a difference in the hair pattern, uh -huh. and that was the only thing wow. that gave it away. So wow. uh, that kind of obsessiveness, I think, is really interesting. Yeah. And what I'm interested in here as well is I've noticed that most of the makeup places here that are represented have, are women mm -hmm. or based with uh, groups of women. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, makes women attracted to this kind of makeup effect, at least in this instance? Well, it's not always hard. But. Yeah, I I mean, I would say that, like, professionally speaking, I've encountered more men, actually, working yes. in a professional makeup setting. Um, so I'm really the only female special effects artist that I've worked with. So, I mean, I can only, I don't, I mean, I know who you're talking about, but I don't really know what it is that would draw a woman into it. For me, I think that um, it's a field that I think more women should be in. I think that... Um, film and entertainment in general, like behind the camera stuff, I think a lot of women, I, I mean, I'm happy to be a part of those type of projects where we can step up and kind of take place behind yeah. what's Well, happening. I'm looking forward to it because some of the movies that I've really, really enjoyed over the last couple of years, many were directed by women. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was... I, I like to call it a new style of tension. Mm -hmm. It's the same story, mm -hmm. but the tension is coming from a different perspective that I would have never thought of. And it's very disturbing. And so I'm like, oh, this could be awesome. So I'm really excited to see women getting into uh, stuff behind the camera, especially with horror, which is mostly dominated by men. Uh, and it's kind of like rock and roll. At first, oh, women, girls in rock and roll. But it's, it's become established now, and it's no longer a problem, right? Yeah. And I'm hoping to see that kind of thing in horror at this point. But uh, I think that'd be great. Yeah. Definitely. It's, uh... Oh, wow. Ah, <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so the people who are listening to the podcast are seeing some great cosplay. And uh, so uh, occasionally we, we veer off and start uh, complimenting people that are there. So uh, what am I looking like right now? Um, well, you're about halfway done, but you've got a black and blue and purple um, bruise across your forehead and eye. And it looks like somebody roughed you up last night. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I'll put a little cut, maybe a little tiny bit of scab looking tight makeup on there and make it real believable. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That sounds great. Uh, one of the things that I talk about on my podcast is the first kiss. Well, the first kiss is the thing that takes you from enjoying something to an obsession to where you want to do it for the rest of your life if you can. Can you tell me what the first kiss was for you? Was it a makeup effect? Was it a movie? Was it just a, a sense of something? I think that like ultimately it was the blood and gore um, and the fact that people were grossed out by what I was doing. Like, that was such a rush to me. Like, having somebody just get squeamish at something that I just created as an artist, like, it invoked, like, such an emotion that somebody wanted to look away. I was like, yes, this is what is going to drive me. Like, that's exactly, like, what it was that just... That hooked me. I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That, I'm seeing that a lot, or I'm hearing that a lot. Uh, subversion. Mm -hmm. There's this yeah. little subversive thing that's going on. There's a woman who does a cooking show uh -huh. where she makes nothing but gross things, and she's only oh, happy thought, yeah, huh? if people are sickened by what she makes. Right. And she's a foodie, which uh -huh. means that she yeah. understands that there are multiple things outside of just taste that matter. And one of those things is presentation, how it looks. So she's subverting purposely one of the big things that a foodie looks for. Right. And I thought, that's really cool. That's pretty yeah. brilliant. So yeah, uh, definitely. with makeup as well, uh, you get to find yourself at a spot where you can make somebody uh, kind of grossed out. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that that's a yeah. thrill. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a rush. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say that's my drug. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, great. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time for an interview. You're Would welcome. you like to tell people how they can find you? Um, yeah, actually, my uh, brand name is Coast Killa Special Effects. So that's K-O-A-S-T-K-I-L-L-A -L -L um, underscore SFX. That's for my Instagram. And for my Facebook, it's the same thing without the underscore. So that's K-O-A-S-T-K-I-L-L-A and -L -L and then SFX, so it's one word. And uh, and then I've got a website, and that's coastkillasfx.com. And you message me, email me, I'll answer your questions, and um, I can ship out custom work. So. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for giving me You're some welcome. of your time, and uh, we'll probably have pictures of this final product uh, up on the webpage. Thanks again.
One of the things that I really enjoy at conventions are the workshops. As you would expect, there were plenty of classes on makeup and prosthetics, but one workshop stuck out on the schedule, a horror-themed cooking show. And this is how I met Casey Hansen, the Martha Stewart of the macabre. Casey was dressed as a 50s-style housewife with Betty Page hair. She made severed zombie fingers out of green hot dogs with onion slivers for fingernails and mozzarella string cheese for bones that stick out of the wounds. And then she made a brain out of macaroni salad. I had second helpings. Casey is a lifelong horror fan and a self-proclaimed foodie. She combines her two loves into a cooking show called The Homicidal Homemaker, where home economics meets horror. You can find her show on Screenbox, and you can find her recipes on her website, thehomicidalhomemaker.com. My favorite recipe is the Dead Alive Custard, which comes with a white chocolate ear and strawberry blood. Or is my favorite the Hellraiser Cinnabite Brownies? Mm, decisions, decisions. I interviewed Casey in between her workshops. And I'm here with Casey Hansen, the homicidal homemaker. This is where home economics meets horror. She is, has a show on Screenbox. There are new episodes. How many episodes are you up to now? Uh, nine full episodes with uh, product reviews and many episodes thrown in. So off the top of my head, I want to say around 18 to 20 maybe okay, all together. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about something that's very unique that Casey's doing. So she has a passion for horror, but she also has a passion for food. And she's taken that to an interesting place, which is she loves to gross people out with the way that the food looks. And uh, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. How did you get to the point of wanting to be the homicidal homemaker? Well, I feel like I kind of was always the homicidal homemaker persona um, in a weird way. Um, I was a fine art major, and basically I took everything I learned as a student and I applied it to food. It started off with cakes, and naturally my love for the macabre crept its way over into the kitchen, and my cakes started getting very creepy, very gross, but I wanted to know how I could apply that to other dishes. Not everyone's a sweet person. So I wonder how I can make appetizers, main courses, savory dishes. And that's basically how it started. I've always uh, had a fondness for food. I'm a big foodie, as they call it, and uh, basically a self-taught cook. So um, I have a lot of fun with it. And any way that I can combine my love of the horror genre with my other passion, which is food, that's uh, I'm all in it. Great. So it sounds like you've been a longtime fan of horror. Yes, lifelong horror fan. Well, I shouldn't say lifelong because when I was very young, I actually hated horror films, but my parents were fans. Uh, when they were dating before, long before I was conceived, they used to go on dates to the drive-in and watch horror movies. So these movies that they watched when they were dating, they would show to me when I was three years old and I would be so scared. I remember, I think my earliest memory of horror was watching the original Fly. And then they sent me to bed in this dark room and I was so terrified, so I hated horror movies. And my mom's like, why are you freaking out? That's fake. It looks so dumb. And that's where the fascination began. I wanted to know how that line between reality and fantasy was obscured. And it was legitimately scaring me to where I wanted my light on. I wanted to sleep in my parents' room. I was very young, <laughs> mind you. It's not like I was a 15-year-old kid when this was happening. But uh, that's how the fascination began. So um, it started at a very early age. I remember my mom making me watch a documentary on the making of Thriller. And she said, why are you scared? That's Michael Jackson. You love Michael Jackson. So um, it started at a very young age, just that fascination. And I've always loved Halloween and things that had a darker aesthetic. Um, I always felt that I kind of identified with the Adams family because everyone called me Wednesday when I was a kid because I had long hair like I do now. But my mom braided it and everyone in my family had long hair and dressed in dark colors. And so I felt like I could kind of relate to this creepy family that wasn't creepy to me. They seemed really rad. So um, for as long as I can remember, I guess I was always a children of the night. Child, child of the night, sorry. <laughs> I started thinking of the quote, children of yep, the night, and I course. threw myself off there. <laughs> like a good horror fan. Yeah. <laughs> you remember all the great quotes. So uh, as a foodie, you know that uh, it's not just flavor or texture that matters so much in food. It's smell and it's also presentation. Yes. So mm -hmm. what made you want to go to where you take presentation and put it in a whole <laughs> different spot? You know, the reaction that I get from people when they see it, they're like, when they're hesitant oh, to try gross. it because it looks that gross. I don't know. I just get a kick out of it. Um, 
I like scaring people. Uh, I like being scared. I like grossing people out with it and telling them it's nothing gross. It's things that you'd normally eat. They're just presented in a gross way. And I don't know, it's just, it's really fun. And seeing people that are completely shocked that, like I just prepared a macaroni salad, but it looked like a brain. They've never had a macaroni salad that looks like a brain. And um, just seeing the look of disgust and then delight on their face. It's, mm. it's, it's heartwarming in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your first victim? First victim uh, would be my family, my parents and my younger brother. So uh, When was this? Um, mm. Gosh, for as long as I can remember, I've been making cakes. and um, But it did start when my brother was pretty young. So I want to say maybe about 15 years ago, I started making just gross-looking food, and I, I would make gelatin brains and they would be sitting in the fridge and it would be Easter and family would be coming over and I'm like here you guys go here's dessert it's a brain and and uh, those were my first victims and now my spouse is uh, the main toxicity tester as I call it so if I make a gross <laughs> vintage recipe or I make something that's very delicious tasting but very gross he usually is the first one and of course my crew of course so uh Give me a list of some of the things for my listeners that you've made that are disgusting. Well, episode one featured my edible entrails. And so they're, it's a spin on a classic mid-century appetizer, a pig in a blanket, but with a grotesque twist on it. So it, um, it was like a giant pig in a blanket using crescent rolls, hot dogs. And also um, I did a pepperoni pizza version. So I assembled it and it looks just like intestines. And I've also done zombie fingers, which are just simply hot dogs, or you can use gourmet sausages or veggie dogs, and they look like fingers. And then I've also tried to incorporate specific horror movies in my recipes. Like I did my Hellraiser Cinnabite brownies, Cinnabite in quotes, of course, because it has cinnamon in it. And um, they look like the little mint configuration on the top. So I gave a tutorial on how to make a stencil so you could do it yourself. I've also made my Camp Crystal cake in honor of uh, Jason's birthday. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and most recently I did my Dead Alive white chocolate strawberry custard. So if you've seen Dead Alive, you know that cringe-inducing scene. <laughs> you got to make this recipe because it looks disgusting, but it tastes really good. Well, that's one of the things <laughs> that really struck me while I was watching your class, is that you brought up Dead Alive. That's not a very common horror movie for the mainstream folks. Uh, so let me know that you have a kind of a passion about horror films. What was your first kiss? It sounds like it might have been the original Fly, but first kiss is usually the one that obsesses you and uh, you end up having a lifelong love fascination sometimes it's not a great experience slumber party massacre 2 <laughs> really? i remember my friends renting it we rented it on vhs and we're like have you ever wanted to rent one of these you know where it's got the scantily clad women on it and you know this guy he's got a guitar with a drill on the end of it we're like how could we not and i remember watching that and immediately became infatuated with that movie and the entire trilogy and some people say that they're a bad movie that's part of the charm on it um, the killer he's so likable he, he looks like Andrew Dice Clay and an Elvis impersonator had a kid and his guitar I mean he's got a guitar with a drill on the end of it how can you not love him and uh, just some of the kills are so good some of the effects are really impressive um, Slumber Party Massacre the original one I think the killer is legitimately terrifying in that one too so in part two, when they brought this charm to the character where he was silly, I don't know, I just really fell in love with it. And I, that's often my gateway horror choice. When I have people who are not, they're not fans. And I'm like, I can make you one. I can show you a movie that will make you laugh more than it scares you. And that's my gateway into getting them <laughs> to become a horror fan. <laughs> so I would say um, very early memory of watching that with my friends and watching it at a slumber party. And my friend's like, this is stupid. I'm like, no, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you have your show, uh, and it seems if it's uh, catching on uh, very quickly as well. What do you want, to, well, if you had the ability to do whatever you wanted with this show or whatever food you'd want to make, what would be the big thing that you're really working up to? I would love to just do this full time because people want the recipes on a weekly basis and we love doing the episodes but we all have full-time careers this is all done outside of it it's all done on a very shoestring budget um, we all wear a lot of hats and we all would love if we could just do this or at least do it more than we're doing now because we're doing the episodes bi-weekly and um, there are some recipes I don't want to say what they are because it'll spoil the surprise because I, I keep pretty uh, quiet about it until the episodes launch um, 
but I would love that we could actually have a set instead of using uh, my friend's kitchen and we actually dress the set to um, and I mean that's a lot of work in itself you know we have to actually go reset up for every episode and it would be nice if we could just kind of have a room that we could always leave like that all year long and not to destroy the magic behind the show or anything but that's something that we really would like to work up to um, we don't make any money off of it we do this because we have fun with it um, I have really awesome friends and family that saw my vision and they want to do whatever they could to support that and I'm very grateful for that wonderful can you just give yourself a, a little bit of a, an advertisement so that uh, people can figure out where they can find you yes this is Casey Hansen the macabre Martha Stewart and you can find my website at the homicidalhomemaker.com and you can also find me on youtube.com slash homicidal homemaker you can also find me on all social media outlets such as Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, head on over to my website to find all of those links and uh, send me a message if you'd make any of my recipes. I'd love to see photos. Great. Casey, thanks so much for giving me some of your time. Thank you for having me. I use the term horrible beautiful a lot. I consider it the point where horror and art meet. Something can be uniquely ugly, or gruesome, or even repulsive, but there's a fascination to it that compels you to keep looking. Maybe it looks so rare or unusual that it has a weird beauty of its own. There's a weird beauty to decay. Mold and spores and microscopic organisms can be revolting in the context of death, but they can be beautiful when they're seen out of context under a microscope. And that weird beauty is what drew me to the work of Margaret Kerrigan and the Pandora FX team. I watched Margaret and her team painstakingly turn a beautiful woman into a spider queen. What's a spider queen? Oh, well, I'll tell you. A half woman, half spider creature with a mouth and jaw of a woman, but a segmented leathery spider head with multiple jet black spider eyes where the forehead should be, with spider hairs and little eyelashes all over it. Ooh, yeah, it was creepy with all the lights on. Margaret started as a sculptor, but she's been working in special effects for almost 13 years, with 400 projects completed and 55 credits in the Internet Movie Database. She and her team were also featured on the reality show Face Off. Margaret has done everything from beauty makeup to creature effects to massive injuries to old age makeup. And she even did a series of makeups that had plant life growing out of the models. Very interesting looking. What impressed me just as much as the artwork was the casual sense of play the entire team had while they worked and the obvious passion about movies they all had in common. Margaret gave me some of her time in between creating a spider queen and creating a lizard woman. And I'm here with Margaret Kerrigan, who is the owner of Pandora FX, uh, a special effects makeup artistry. Uh, and it's been around since 2012. And uh, Margaret is yet another of the people that I've met here uh, at this con that really have some intriguing work that they've been doing. The artistry that I've been seeing uh, really caught my eye. Makeup effects that feel very organic. And that's one of the things that I'm really interested in. One of the terms that I use a lot in my uh, podcast is horrible beautiful. In other words, it's finding the beauty inside of the things that at some point people tend to look at as ugly, but looking at it in a different angle and allowing that to really be something uh, exciting and interesting to the eye and taking it from there. So can you give me a little bit of an idea of what your, your, uh, your modus operandi is? You know, it's funny. I actually got my start in fine art. So like linear work and rhythm and composition, those have always been like a foundation of my work. So when I fell in love with makeup effects, of course, like everybody else, um, I did a lot of horror stuff, you know, and I loved it, and I thought that was so great. But I remember after doing a couple years, doing TV shows and stuff, and animal attacks, and doing a My Zombie pinup calendar back in 2008. That was super fun. But um, my, I became thirsty artistically, you know, for something more, you know, something alive, literally. And then I ended up doing a series of plant work where we were having plants grow out of people. And I was still using the traditional materials of you know, wax and glue and things and, and prosade and stuff and, and just time and patience. 
but it was more about the composition, having grass growing and, and just reaching and stuff towards the light, you know, making sure there's a backstory still. You know, every image still needed a backstory. Having ivy and sort of draping over somebody's back and stuff, and, but looking like it's growing out, you know, like something had burst gently open, like when a flower is ready to bud, but all the leaves just flowing out. And we've done um, what I call an Ophelia. So I've actually done three Ophelias at this point in my life. And my first Ophelia um, is a beautiful woman that we painted all pale and then we put moss on her, we glued moss on her. And there's just like a little bit of rhythm and flow to that. And then she laid in the water. We made like a little black pond and she laid in that. And that was beautiful. That was one of my favorite pieces that I ever did. And I actually put that one on face off when they were like, show us some examples of your work. You know, so I put some big prosthetic thing out there, you know, from this huge famous YouTuber group, Smosh. <laughs> and I put that out there and, and everybody loves that and eats that up. But I had to put something beautiful out there. You know, early on in my work, I figured out that I loved the crossover of beautiful things, creepy things. It didn't matter if something was visceral, sensual, and stuff disturbing. I think it's just that I seek all those reactions and emotions. But I think that it's when you can marry it together and make it elegant, you know, I feel something even more. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Elegant yeah. is, a, is a great word for it. Now, yeah. uh, you mentioned something that, that you haven't been doing makeup forever. Uh, yeah. You uh, have a different background. So what is it about makeup that just attracted you? What was the thing that made this what you want to do now? It connected me to everybody else. It brought me to life. I was in this box, like a solitary artist, you know, I'd be drawing things, sculpting things. I had a lot of fun doing 2D animation and I, I, had, a, I had a great time at school. But uh, when I picked up a brush and started painting somebody, you know, the human becoming my canvas is something that I learned about over time. But I had that joy of creating that Frankenstein feeling and stuff. I just, it's alive, you know, and, and I got that even more, you know, in class, it was like, okay, I made that look. But then I was like, yeah, so let's go to set. So I started taking jobs right away, right after the first semester. So my very first job for my first director was out in the desert. We went to the Mojave Desert and it was just sunburn and stuff. But I would, I got his script, I thought of the backstory, I thought about why this looks like that, why I'm painting like this, how it progresses this way. Then the hardest thing was doing it out of order because that's how you actually film. And I was like, okay, so I, I wrapped my head around that. And um, that experience was so amazing, I turned to somebody else on camera crew and I said, is it always like this? And he laughed and smiled and said, I don't know, is it? And um, and I decided at the end of that semester, I had so many good experiences uh, with him, with another woman named Tasha, and another guy named Roman, three amazing people to work for. I had a good time. I decided, okay, this is my job now. This is my career. This is what I'm gonna do. And it kind of came full circle because I got married two years ago and I had the director, Adrian, be our officiant at the wedding, <laughs> you know. So um, he's kind of like, <laughs> he's, um, he was there when my life changed at one point and we brought him back and stuff, you know. Um, we shared that day with everybody, with family, with friends, and I had a good time. But it meant a lot to me um, to take the people from my life and film and stuff and just make it all one thing, yeah. you know. That's great. So uh, you mentioned Face Off. Uh, mm -hmm. How long have you been doing makeup and how did you get on Face Off? Okay, so I've been doing makeup for about 12 and a half years now. Started working right away. Um, I When Face Off first came out, it was cool because I saw myself on TV. I saw what I did, you know, and um, before that they just had like a, you know, makeup competitions, other competitions, and I was so excited. I was like, I know that. I can do that, you know. Uh, but they were doing some pretty crazy things. Like the first winner was uh, Connor McCullough. He's so amazing. He was actually an effects teacher. <laughs> and he went to work in Hollywood right after that, you know. But um, it was inspiring, you know. But I just kept working on, on TV shows and movies and stuff, you know. And then finally, I just really wanted to do creatures, you know. So I was like, well, let me try stuff out, you know. And eventually I auditioned um, for season four. And uh, they, they didn't take me at that time, but it's, always, it's a process sometimes with some of the people. They, they really want to keep coming back to you too and develop you. And they came back to me uh, about a year later and I was like, oh, I got to think about it, you know? And since then, I was kind of hooked. I, feel, I felt like I have to do creatures, you know? Because I'd hit an effects ceiling um, of character makeups, creature makeups. Horror is actually super easy to me because it's anatomical and I've studied anatomy. You know, this is actually, it's super easy and exciting, but creatures were a challenge. You know, I was like, oh, I was hooked, so now I have to do creatures. 
Well, your creatures are amazing. So uh, in this weekend, I got to see a spider queen be created, and I got to see a reptile queen or a reptile warrior uh, from scratch, which was really fun to watch, uh, yeah. and seeing everybody just get so almost hypnotized by the work that's there. What goes into a good creature? Okay. So... I sit down and I tell myself, what do I want to make? If I'm making stuff for me, you know, um, just forget clients and stuff. We'll talk about them later. If I'm making something for me, I say, what do I love? And I've always loved dragons. Like, I love Anne McCaffrey and stuff. Um, and I love, I've always been fascinated by the look of them. You know, I'd see dragon heart and I, I see the way they do it on Game of Thrones. And I was like, well, how do I want to do it? You know, so you just start, I start looking at lizards. I start looking at other people's dragons. Um, I start looking at whatever I like, and then I make them. Um, these days, I use Pinterest. So I have like thousands and thousands of pins, and I have huge boards, and I share one board with my other FX friends, you know, and we load that with tons of stuff. And the good thing about tons of inspiration is you're not going to copy. You're going to learn what you love, and then you're going to take that and put it in. Um, and then I finally sit down, and I start sketching. That's the fine art background. I sit there. And I pull up tracing paper, I start on the back page, and I start sketching, and then I go forward through the pages, and I try things out. It's kind of like Photoshop, but paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when I find something I love, you know, then I do it. So I had a class with a master sculptor last year, Jordi Shell, and I showed him these two drawings. He's like, I love those. He's like, do them both. You know, so I was like, oh, God. That's what teachers do, right? They make you think. Right. And uh, so I merged both the concepts into one sculpture. And I was fascinated with it. I really enjoyed it. And it, it was horrible because it was supposed to be like a five-day class, so I was going to go down for one week in L.A., but he changes it to weekends. So I'm driving down every week to go to this sculpture class from the Bay Area to, El to Chatsworth. Mm. You know? <laughs> and, um, but it just made me want to try even harder. You know? And I found I finally broke down my process, you know? and I figured something out. And I just did something for a TV show uh, less than a week ago, you know, I did it so fast and everybody I went to set they know me I work for them all the time. It's Japan TV. Uh, it's world astonishing news mm. and I've been working with them for seven years. I make huge fat men. I make huge fat ladies um, Transformations medical conditions and stuff, but one of the things I think that's amazing is they're really good people They're amazing people. They always want a family-oriented story They want to show the process when things got better for people when they got treatment you know, it's instead of they're not exploitative, you know, they they're interested in the human story and getting people and conveying that and getting that across to them. So I get to do whatever I want for them, but the catch is it has to be super fast and I right. don't have much time. And last week everything fell in place and I was like, I understood that like spark that I got last year. I figured out everything about how I want to sculpt. And so now I'm just like, I want to unleash. I want to go home and the next things that I make. I'm just excited. I'm like, I want to do Cthulhu and tentacles and da da da. Mm. But that's like, that's how it is for me. That's how it is to be me when I'm making stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> do you have any uh, um, people that your work uh, is inspired by, uh, artists that you admire, uh, yeah. makeup or painting? Let's go two places. Let's go to sculptors. I love okay. Jordan Shell and I feel him. Like, he's somebody that I vibe with as an artist when I look at his stuff. But when I met him, I was like, oh, God, you know, I actually like being around him. <laughs> like, I, I get him and stuff, and, it, and it's real and it's natural. Somebody else that I really love, too, is Paul Komoda. He has these amazing, creepy sculptures and this stuff, and I love seeing all the, it's like you see human anatomy just morphed and, and, and twisted and all these different impossible alien shapes in a way that's, that feels very fresh to me. Um, Simon Lee, also known as Spider Zero, his work is amazing. You know, I've been studying it and I was like, oh, maybe I want to take a workshop with him. But I usually have time like once every year or two to go out. So, you know, I have to teach myself or study. And um, so I love his work as a sculptor. But then for me, with makeup, uh, Greg Canham. I love his work. You know, I sat down, I was taken on a date in sixth grade to see Dracula. Most importantly, I saw Dracula. And, <laughs> and I just, I was fascinated. My mind was blown away. You know, I, I was very aware at that time and stuff, you know, the different bat forms, the werewolf, um, even, even that old age slash vampire look with the big web, wig and the wardrobe. And later on, when you go through Cinefax, you know, I saw how they did like the bigotures and stuff, you know. Um, it, was, it was fascinating for me, you know, those two together, Greg Canham. You know, doing this whole vision and stuff with Francis Ford Coppola. Um, 
that and Greg Canham, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire, Benjamin Button. I love his work. You know, I was there right before he got the second Oscar. He did a big um, uh, panel and stuff with other makeup artists for the union and stuff right before he got his second Oscar. And you could see it, like he was kind of edgy. You didn't know if he was going to get it, but he's brilliant, I know, but people are like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I notice now when I go to, to watch movies and I'm looking at makeup effects artists, nine out of ten times the name is male. Yet here I am mm -hmm. at this con and just about every booth that I've been to is run by a woman mm -hmm. uh, or is uh, dominated by women artists. Do you see a change happening? Uh, do you think that there's something with the makeup artist effects at this point that's just appealing to women at this point? I know it's a broad statement, but... You have to, you have to see something first sometimes, you know? So one, things, one of the things that really impressed me here is a lot of young girls came up to me and they were asking me about make, doing makeup and they were showing me their Instagrams and they were showing me their photos. You need role models, you know? Um, so like, just as much as you might have Dick Smith to like carve a path with us innovation-wise and stuff and to establish a foundation of this is how this is done so people can jump from there because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before, you need women to do that. And I think v has been a really huge role model. She's a powerful role model. She's very creative, she can do effects, she can do beauty. Very strong, um, great leadership, opinionated. She's a department head. And I think that women like her set an example, you know? Some, there's somebody that we can look up to. She was actually a role model for me for a long time. The first time I ever went to IMATS, I saw her and I thought, I want to be like her. You know, I want to I wanna, I wanna do all that and I want to run things, you know? So a department head, like horror films. I just did a film last... Um, Last spring, and it's called Lasso, and it has Sean Patrick Flannery in it. And there's all sorts of death and horror and stuff in there and blood, you know. And we still have to make decisions, you know, and collaborate. You know, we have to still do beauty makeup. We have to still do regular makeup. Um, we do a lot of crossover with stunts, with a special effects coordinator, with hair, you know. Um, so, like, the whole thing, you know. But I'm there for it. I love to do that. Um, I like to get my hands dirty. I never thought about being a woman in effects. I just thought of myself as I'm an artist. But I think it's because I went to art school. And when you go to art school, um, at least in San Francisco, it, being a man or woman has nothing to do with nothing, you know. And so I just walk in the world and stuff. And it's just about, like, standing on your own. You know, I don't, I don't see male or female. I observe it. I'm not blind. But I'm kind of proud of it. You know, most of the people who work with me are women just because, you know, that's who's around me. But I'm looking for more men to work with. But it's not about that. You know, it's just about what is it like to work with you? you know, what kind of creator are you? Great. Now, a question I always ask everybody, especially if uh, they seem to be a horror fan, yeah. is something obsesses you to allow you to go down these paths. And I know this uh, that your background is more on the fine arts, but mm. movie. Uh, what was your first kiss? What was the movie that just got you and you went, okay, I'm going to be following this, this group of films for a while? Robocop. Yeah. It melted my mind, mm -hmm. like literally, it tore me apart. It wasn't too long between Robocop and Total Recall. Those two, actually, those two are very powerful, and they had a huge influence me, influence on me as a person. You know, when I saw them, I was amazed, and I suddenly understood that makeup effects was out there. It was real, you know, and it's something you can do. Um, but it seemed like something that happened in a faraway land, you know, but it had a big impact on me. So. Well, thank you for giving me so much of your time. Uh, do you want to give yourself a shout-out on how people can get in touch with the market? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can find me at pandora-fx.com. Uh, you can find us also on Facebook, too, under Pandora Effects. We have a lot of our adventures over there, so I'd love to meet new people who love effects, and we're out in the Bay Area. So, <laughs> Thanks again for your time. Yeah. My weekend at Sinister Creature Con was enriched by the conversations I had with these and the many other artists that were there. The artistry was amazing, of course, but what really impressed me the most about these people was the passion they had for what they do. Because each of them were on a different career trajectory when suddenly some deep inner voice compelled them to take the chance to follow their passion to embrace the value of a sense of play, to have fun with their lives. The business plan didn't start with working in makeup effects. The business plan didn't start with making gross looking food. The business plan didn't even start with founding a horror convention from scratch. 
And yet, look how cool things got when they veered from the plan. So, when you're looking in the mirror this Halloween, putting on your costume and your makeup, and you're thinking about how much fun it would be to do it every day, remember there's still time. You're not dead yet. But with the right amount of latex and fake blood, you can make it look like you are. Happy Halloween from me. And thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, hellbentforhorror.com. You can download every episode directly from there, read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. You can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthorror. A lot of the great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthorror. Now, for you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Hellbent for Horror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. Till next time, stay hellbent.